Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming on a Friday, of all days, at this time, with this kind of weather. Today, I'm going to show you the changes that I made to the class website. I finally got to edit and post on YouTube all the videos of the classes that were offered during the first and the second week, with the exception of the first one when I relied on Eco360, but that was a fail. We are going to watch a scene, two scenes from A Bronx Tale, which includes a famous Machiavellian exchange, a dialogue entirely based on the words from The Prince. Then I will continue and finish my examination of the last short story, the novella from the Decameron, to appreciate what is in general Machiavellian about it in terms of culture and ideology, general principles. We will re-examine briefly the diagram of power, control, influence, force, with all the key terms that I introduced last week. And we, to, to complete what we started last week, we will apply that matrix to the story of the garage, the person ignoring the sign that only monthly subscribers should enter the garage, and also the prisoner's dilemma, and finally, just a brief review of the idea that politicians are all liars, cheaters, etc., and what's behind that perception, okay? It feels like a lot, but it's all bits of five or 10 minutes. As you can see here, I added all the pictures of the notes that I put on the board during previous classes. You find some of them in here, in reference to the various stories, and also going back to the other week, where you find links to specific pages on the class wiki. If you scroll down, this, this is the diagram I was referring to, which I will put again on the screen to review some of the particulars, to add examples, and also to test our comprehension of this model in reference to simple examples, such as a policeman flashing a badge where does it fall? Is it force? Is it influence? Is it a form of control? A policeman flashing, opening the jacket to show that they have a gun, a handgun in the holster. Or a policeman drawing their gun at someone, etc. Or as we will see in the film, well, we will not see it, that particular scene, but it's one of it's in the premise to the film, a mafia guy in a lineup is not properly identified by, a, by an eyewitness, which happens all the time. Where does it fall in this model? What kind of control produced that outcome, etc.? So keep that in mind when you review the website, give the proper attention to these pictures as well. As I said before, at the end of each week, week one and week two, you now find this small section called digital recordings and videos of the lectures. I kept the audio recording, of course, of the first lecture because it's the only recording we have. And the second one, but both the second and the third Wednesday January 26th and Friday now are associated with a video and I just have to click 
And there it is in high resolution, the screen or the uh, board are clearly visible. The quality of the audio is excellent. Of course, I didn't do much editing, right? At some point during one of the classes, I believe it was this week, I drank from the bottle and then inadvertently, I put the bottle right in front of the iPad. So you have like a 15 minutes commercial for Poland Spring because the label on the bottle is visible in the lower part of the video. But otherwise, everything is good. I didn't have time to add the topics in here. And ideally, I would like to have chapters so that you can click in the description to the link, click on the links and be transported just to a section where I'm talking about the Decameron's novella because that's what you want to review because you were in class but you want to review that. I'll see if I can find the time to do it. I spent a lot of time simply finding the best way to transfer a high resolution video which is five or, or 10 gigabytes out of the iPad um, because it's a disaster. I, I love that, that tablet, but professionally, it's not up to par. Same thing for week two. At the end of week two, you find a short section that says videos of the lectures, and you find Monday's lecture, Wednesday's lecture, etc. Okay, so especially if one of you is one of those few students who added during week two, make sure you watch all of those videos, make sure you come and visit me during office hours or Zoom with me to ask questions about those lectures and the contents of those videos. Keep in mind, the first assignments are just readings. You're supposed to read the story of the knight, the dog, and the snake, the story of Paolo and Francesca, and keep in mind that the link takes you to the whole Canto five of Inferno. However, the episode that we're interested in, Paolo and Francesca, starts at around verse 70. Okay? And finally, the Decameron's story. Besides that, you have another link to a reading. So all of the readings this week are online. And that is this brief excerpt from the introduction to Stanley Bing's What Would Machiavelli Do? The ends justify the meanness. You click and you find that excerpt and you read about it. At some point, we will engage in this kind of discussion if you want to use these as guidelines, as reading points, as focus points, please do. It is enough to do. That's all in terms of readings and read them by next week. There is a date, but of course, as soon as possible. Later on, I will put under week three the assignment that I briefly described this week which will focus on one of the con games, one of the tricks described in a page, in a separate page that I'll show you at some point next week and apply to that the Machiavellian schema that I showed before, where you find influence, force, authority, deterrence, control of the outcome, repeatability, predictability, necessity, etc., etc. Okay. So, A Bronx Tale is a film from 1993. It marked the directorial debut of Robert De Niro. It is the first film he did as a director. The film is based on a play from the, 19, the late 1980s that was written by Chas Palminteri, who's also one of the protagonists in the film. The story of the film is the following. We are in 1960, 
in the Bronx in an area where the Italian American community and the black community are having a difficult relationship. And there is a family, a typical family, low middle class family from that period. Robert De Niro plays the part of Lorenzo. He's a bus driver. He's married. He has a son, Calogero, who's about nine. And of course, at a corner near a bar slash restaurant, you constantly see these guys in gray or blue suits. Oh my God, am, am I dressed like a mafioso? <laughs> and of course they have a tie. Oh no. Okay, you know you have to respect me. <laughs> We'll be careful. <laughs> and so there is an understanding. People know that the mafia is there, that the power of the mafia is represented by their goons. And Chaspar Minteri is the mafia chief of that particular small area, of that neighborhood. Okay? And keep in mind, how it worked at the time. You have to assume that Charles Palminteri, who plays the part of Sonny, is a made member of the Mafia, someone who was initiated and is formally listed in the organization of the Mafia. The people around him, the people you see interacting with him, those that are the members of his group, probably are not members of the Mafia. They're hoping to be recruited. They're hoping to get to that level because once you are a made member of the Mafia, then what kind of power do you gain? Influence. Influence, right? Influence because even if you don't have a weapon on you, and usually Mafia guys from that period did not carry a gun because why take the risk of being stopped and searched and going to jail for illegal carrying a, a weapon without a license illegally? Also because the mafia guys from the period disliked the use of weapons. Not only are they dangerous, but they're noisy. So strangulation was, was quite common at the time as a, a, a way of killing for the mafiosi. So it is influence because that's why you dress so nicely, right? You want to be recognized. Influence and authority are always associated with symbols, right? For a policeman, it's the uniform. In fact, British policemen don't even carry a gun, right? Just a stick. And the uniform should be enough to get respected. So it is influence. At the beginning of the movie, Calogero, the boy, happens to be out in the street and he witnesses a violent episode. Someone is beating up a man, Joe Pesci, who in fact is a member of the higher echelon of the mafia. And Sonny, the local mafia representative, runs to help him, and of course there is a lot of violence, Joe Pesci is beaten to a pulp, the other guy is killed, the police comes because there was a shooting. Oh, it's not a contradiction because of course Chas Palminteri comes in late because he has to get the gun from inside this bar restaurant. So, Calogero is an eyewitness. As such, the police interrogate him about the episode. And they take this boy in front of a lineup. They improvise a lineup. And they get all the guys they uh, can catch in the area, including Sonny, 
the mafioso, Charles Palminteri, who couldn't get away because he had to help his friend first and foremost. So the boy is in front of the culprit, the perp, but he does not identify him. He tells the police, I don't recognize anyone. Normally, we would call this influence, right? It is influence because Calogero is not forced with a gun pointed at him or a gun pointed at his father's head. In fact, it is quite possible Calogero is nine. Calogero doesn't, and, and Calogero is not the smartest boy in terms of street smarts. So, the implication in the film is that maybe it is influence, maybe the boy understands that there are rules that even his father, who is an honest man, follows out of prudence and to protect his family. Or more probably, the boy, even though he saw all this violence, the boy has developed an interest in Sony. That's something, the germ, the seed, of a friendly relationship is born out of that strange encounter. So Sonny gets away, is not arrested, does not go to prison. He repeatedly offers money to Calogero's family and Lorenzo, being an honest bus driver, making an honest living, refuses, rejects those offers. He offers a better job to Lorenzo, Calogero's father. Again, he rejects that offer. However, from that point on, we follow throughout the movie about 10 years of friendship between the boy, Calogero, and the mafioso, Sonny. What we see now is a famous Machiavellian scene where Calogero steps out of his father's bus. He gets on the bus, not just to go home, but to talk to his father. And has a dialogue, has an exchange with Sonny because Sonny plays the part of his mentor. He doesn't teach him violence. He teaches him, the boy, how to navigate the difficult situations of social, created by social interactions. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes will watch. I put the subtitles just in case to make it easier to follow. And at the end, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And there it was. So, first of all, trying to connect what we heard in this scene to the model of Machiavellianism and Machiavellian games or practices in general, what can we say? For example, when the mafioso Sonny talks about availability, what is it really about? What term from the model I put on the board would you associate with availability? Presence. Sorry, Nigel? Presence. Presence? Presence. Right, but what's the purpose of this availability and being closer to the people in the neighborhood, those who like him and support him and those who fear him? Control. Control, right? Availability is another form of control. In this situation, it is the strategy deployed by the mafioso in order to maintain control of the neighborhood. And that's why, as I said before, in order to keep that control, instead of using force all the time, which would be expensive, would be resource heavy, because the more time you pull out a gun or you beat someone up, and the easier it is, to provoke a reaction from the local police forces, they use visibility. That is to say, not only is Sonny there, but he has the best possible suit on so that everyone 
will see him because in a neighborhood that is middle class or low income class, anyone can spot a $300 suit, $300 from the 1960s, right? So that is the symbolic form of authority and influence that he deploys in the neighborhood. And then he says about being loved, being feared, and the whole dialogue is taken from two passages of Machiavelli's The Prince. This is from chapter 17, page 89 of your textbook. From the above, a debate arises, this is Machiavelli, whether it is better to be loved than feared or the contrary. That is the question asked by the boy, Sonny, the boy Calogero, or C to Sonny. The answer is that one would want to be both the one and the other. But because it is difficult to join them together, if one has to do without one of the two, it is much safer to be feared than loved. For the following may be said generally about men, that they are ungrateful, changeable, pretenders and dissemblers, avoiders of dangers, desires of gain, and while you do them good, they're wholly yours, offering you their blood, their property, their life, and their children, as I said above. Which is connected to what uh, Sonny says about his goons, about the people around him. If he tells a joke, they laugh. And he says, I know I'm funny, but I'm not that funny. That is to say, it is his influence that causes them to laugh. The same way that if I tell a joke, if I try to be humorous in class, at least some of you laugh. And you do it because I'm the professor. I'm, I know I'm funny, but I'm not that funny, right? And mind you, you'll do the same tomorrow, a year, three years from now, with your boss. Your boss will tell a joke, you'll laugh. And it doesn't matter how funny the boss is. The boss has influence. Now, for the last question, how is the dialogue, this change in the restaurant between the mafioso and the boy, connecting to the next, the very next scene? Is the scene a random addition to the story, or is there a segue? Is there a connection between this lesson about love and fear, availability, which equals influence and control, and the beating up of the bikers. Edmund? Um, in the previous scene, uh, when he's talking to the boy, he says, um, violence isn't always the answer. And then, right, but, th but then they, they beat yeah. the bikers. When he goes and they give them, he gives right? them a chance. He goes, now you have to leave, or he, first he gives them beer, then he says, now you have to leave. Right, so what, what happens? What strategy have deployed and executed when the bikers come in? Which is a form of, it's not exactly appeasement, right? He says, oh, spoken like a gentleman, right? Meaning, if you respect me and you see how I'm dressed, how I behave, how much control I display and self-control in particular, if you behave, I'll behave. So the first exchange that takes place when the bikers enter the bar is about mutual respect, is about the deployment of influence, okay? I know you're in my neighborhood, but as long as you behave, you can have a beer and then be on your way out. And by the way, what about the dress code? Why the, 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 the barista, the owner of the bar, insists and there are mentions they're not dressed properly. Are you wondering? You mean I just want them in the bar? No, there is something different that is connected to the culture of that time and to the Italian American culture, including connections to the mafia. Yes? Would it be dependent the way they dress with their, their status? Mm, not exactly. Of course, it's a matter of interpretation, right? Uh, it's not definitive, but uh, Christina? I was going to say something similar. I was thinking class as a factor. No, 
Daniel? It's a mafia bar, so they want to... It's not exactly a bar. That's the point. It's not exactly a bar. It's like their, like, headquarters, like where they all meet up. Where did they meet up? Not in public bars. Scotty didn't have a bar. They were classified commercially as clubs because it was easier for Italian-Americans in general, forget about connections to the mafia, to get a license for a club with a membership than a bar. And then it's not a problem, because if you enter the club and you're not a member, well, before you sit down to drink, you, you get a card, you pay $10, $20, and you become a member, okay? So once you have an establishment classified as a club, then you can enforce parameters such as a dress code. And, and this is true of, of, of the gentlemen's clubs in New York, of the uh, highfalutin places where rich, wealthy New Yorkers go to have a cigar and women are not allowed in, and you have to dress in a certain way, you need to have a tie and a jacket, etc., etc., etc. And it's legal to discriminate, it's legal to keep someone out if they don't have a jacket, if they don't have a membership, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so it's a club, that's why that exchange, but they say, you can stay. Of course, they don't respect the influence of Sony. At that point, it's just a logical jump in a Machiavellian frame to go from the deployment of influence, influence fails, you have force available, they have sticks, and they have a lot of guys, a lot of manpower, and you deploy that force. The outcome is the same. If control can be maintained by influence, that's the best way, the most cost effective, right? Because there is no uh, police involved for any reason. If influence fails, then in a mafia system, you can go from influence to force. And then you see the kids in the neighborhood participating in this. Are they members of the organization? Are they mafiosi? No. It's another example of influence. They follow the example of Sonny. If Sonny, the mafia chief of the neighborhood, is doing something to those bikers, then there is good reason to imitate his example, to follow his example, to stay by his side, by his good side. And love and fear, you find that in Machiavelli, but you find that in the culture of the 16th century in general. Of all people, for example, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, uh, expanded in his writings about a theory that was not originally his own, but he uh, placed it in a, a, a central uh, position in his ideology of the amicus regis, the friend of the king. That is to say, Everyone wants to be loved by the king. Everyone wants to be the friend of the king because the king has a lot of power. And for the founder of the Jesuits, what was the consequence? What is that the Jesuits did for the next 200 years until around the time of the French Revolution, people started to close the convents of the Jesuits, throw the Jesuits out of some countries altogether. What they did was instead of trying to convert the population, let's place a few Jesuits at court. Let's make sure that the confessor of the royal family of France or Spain, etc., is a Jesuit. Because if we convince through influence the king, the queen, the members of the royal family to display religious behaviors, then people will follow their example due to influence whether or not they want to convert and, and live a saintly religious life, okay? It's all about influence. So this was enough for the film. Um, I think the film, I bought the film some time ago. Um, the film is available on Prime Video, for example. If you have a local library that you can go to, you can also find it. Of course, you're not required to, to watch the film, but if you want to. Or you find it in Prime Video for a small amount, $2.99 or $3.99. Now, let's, let's re-examine just briefly the novella of 
cappelletto. This terrible man who renders a false confession saves the day for the business people, in, the Italian business people in France, operating in France, protects their business and their business reputation, and dies, right? And he's considered the hero of the novella Okay. So, what's the difference between the first two examples and the last two examples? In here we said we have moral constraints, moral boundaries that should be enforced. And if the characters didn't abide by those standards and rules and behaviors, then the implication is that they should have for the betterment of themselves. And in the last, we find a character who does what he has to, to achieve the outcome. What is really the difference? The main difference is that in the first two examples, you find universal laws or universal rules that apply not just to the example of the knight and his particular situation, his particular problem with the dog, the baby, etc or the particular situation of the romantic liaison that the affair that develops when Paolo and Francesca are together even though Francesca is married to Paolo's brother. There are universal set of rules and standards that you have to follow in these kinds of cultural frames no matter what. What's the difference with this episode? Really is that there are no universal standards. That everything that makes the character in the novella a hero is derived from the context itself. That is to say, when you read these novellas, you get the idea that you should, as a reader, do certain things and not do others. In all kinds of situations, right? So from this, from that, from this story, from that episode in the Divine Comedy, you can extrapolate universal laws. When it comes to Cappelletto, you don't really get the same kind of laws out of the episode. You can learn a lesson, but in reference to behavior, there isn't much to be said. What is that you should imitate? What is that you should avoid? Which are the focal points of the first two examples. You just have to say that Ciappelletto is the hero because he saves the day, Ciappelletto is the hero because he does what he has to, and Ciappelletto is the hero because he achieves the outcome, he maintains control of the situation, deploying a strategy that is a winning strategy. And why is it a winning strategy? Does it have some universal nature? Uh, not really, or, or only marginally. That is to say, he is the winner in that situation when he renders a convincing false confession to the priest, simply because what are the circumstances of that particular context? The circumstances are the following. They are in a deeply religious society where people can be sinners, right? It's not a society in France or Italy where people always follow the rules of religion, right? So one could simply say, well, if you know that some people are sinning, then there is no reason to trust Chapeleto, especially since he is a stranger. However, as we said earlier this week, Chapeleto has a successful strategy in mind in that instead of saying, oh, Father, I'm pure, I'm saint, I'm a good man, he says the opposite. He plays a mind game with the confessor by saying, oh, I'm terrible, I cursed my mother, I got angry at terrible people, I broke the fast. One of the examples is that, oh, one day I was fasting and only uh, eating salad and uh, drinking water, 
And then, after I finished my fasting, I had something else, and it tasted so good. And, and the priest says, well, where's the sin there? So the priest is, is forced to uh, uh, unpack the episode in a different way, and then be lectured by Chapeleto himself, indirectly. And Chapeleto says, no, because if you fast, you do it for God, and enjoying food so much, finding so much pleasure afterwards, is offensive to God, in whose name you uh, did this uh, period of fasting, etc., etc., time and time again. Chapelletto appro approaches the solution, maintains control with this con game. And the other element, because as I said, it's not like the priest ignores that there are sinners or liars, right? But why is the priest conned so easily by Chapelletto? What is the key element in that particular context? What is the one circumstance that, make, that makes, by itself, Chapelletto's strategy so successful. You would think he has no reason to lie because he's dying. Exactly, right? Because it's a deeply religious society, to the point where we can hardly find any proof that there were atheists during the Middle Ages. It's not until the 1500s that we find anecdotal evidence in private documents that someone is really an atheist. Before that, during the centuries of the Middle Ages, of course people didn't go to church or sinned or didn't uh, believe in uh, the, 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 the biblical scriptures and commandments, etc. But they never denied the existence of God, right? That is atheism. They never denied the existence of hell and paradise. So in this deeply religious society, even a sinner coming to the last moment will repent. Because there is no coming back. It's an eternity of damnation. So that is the circumstance that creates the foundation for the believability of Chapeletto. And that is why I suggest that Chapeletto is the opposite of a saint or the Antichrist. Because he sacrificed his soul to win the day. And with no advantage or profit for him. Just out of love for evil things or just out of love for women. But when you want to extrapolate a lecture, a lesson out of this example, can the message be formulated in such a way that, so for this example, for the story of the night, I can think of formulations that are universal, right? Man should be the leader of the house. Don't trust women because they're so emotional. Universal, right? You can apply them to any kind of other situation. Second episode, Paolo Francesca. Don't have an extramarital affair. Be loyal, faithful to your husband, no matter what. Don't commit a carnal sin. And you apply them to all kinds of situations. But in the case of Chapeletto, is the universal lesson cheat and lie? No, it cannot be. And you know what? Be exactly because, as Nigel suggested, it works only if you are dying, because otherwise they won't believe you, right? So easily. But what is Machiavellian is that it does work in that context. So universal law, universal law, relative. That is to say, everything we learn here in the episode of Chapeleto is relative to that particular context. If the context changes, then it's not applicable anymore. Such as lying in a context where you're not really dying ah, might not work as well, right? And this is what Machiavelli is about. Going from universal laws of politics, the leader, the prince, the king should behave always in a certain way, must be honest, must be not lying, not cheating, must respect his subjects, must be acting on behalf of his subject for their better good, etc. Instead of that, you have a series of contexts, and each context 
requires different skills and different rules. So in that context, Tapeleto did what he had to do. Changing the circumstances, the same strategy does not work as well. And that's why the prince is so cryptic in a way, or contradictory, or perplexing. And even if you read it for 10 years in, in jail, uh, as uh, the character of Charles Palminteri did, you still find the same kind of contradictions, unless you understand that Machiavelli never advocated for meanness and evil at all costs, in all situations. He simply included a lot of examples of evil behaviors, evil immoral practices, because that was the nature of the contexts, of the historical contexts and situations of his own time, which was a time of political crisis and military crisis. And so the deployment of those cruel strategies was just an attempt to find extreme measures to put a stop to those crises that uh, involved uh, the city of Florence and most of Italy being under attack uh, from uh, outsider countries, Spain, France, the German Empire. But at that time, we call it just the empire, okay? So Machiavelli appears to be contradictory because Machiavelli doesn't say that you always have to be cruel. You can be successful by being cruel. Then he tells you, you can be successful by being peaceful and paternal as a leader. So what gives? It depends on the context. And going farther than the idea of a context that dictates the rules of the game, and in that context, whatever brings you to your outcome, your desired outcome is good, whatever takes you from achieving that outcome is bad, in that context, just in that context. So cruelty in a context can be good, Re relative to the outcome, in another context, can be disastrous. And not only Machiavelli does that, he goes one step farther in, in a very modern, innov innovative way. He approaches the idea of context as an ecosystem. An ecosystem where your skills themselves, your leadership skills, are good only if they're in demand, if they're required, in that context. So, as a leader, if you find yourself in a context where cruelty, lying, cheating, killing your competitors, your enemies are required, and you're cruel, and you're good at cheating, you're good at lying, you'll be successful. But if you have this predisposition and you operate in a context where deploying those evil strategies, those immoral strategies, will just get you exposed in the media and your career will come to a disastrous end and you'll go to jail, then there is no evil to be praised, to be celebrated, to be advocated. And the best example that we'll see later on in Machiavelli is the example of Moses, where Machiavelli has this incredible formulation. He says, it was necessary for Moses to find the Jews enslaved in Egypt to become their leader. That is to say, he was the right leader for that context. If he was born when the Jews were in Israel, he would not have been their leader because he would have had skills that were not in demand within that context, and that's the basic principle of an ecosystem, even in reference to nature, even when it is defined and how it is defined by Darwin. 